I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. This week I'm speaking to Adam Kirtland who began gardening seriously at the start of lockdown. His initial interest has become a full-blown obsession and I'm sure many of us can relate to that. I initially thought this episode would be useful for other new gardeners who began to fully embrace gardening earlier in the year and can now identify with the challenges presented by going back to work full-time, especially those who are going back into the office. For me, as someone who started properly gardening at the same age as Adam and who embraced it with as much passion, it was a reminder of the challenges I faced when I started, particularly around sourcing good information. Back then, Instagram was just a twinkle in Facebook's eye. So for more seasoned gardeners, it may be a useful reflection upon how we communicate with newer gardeners. I start by asking Adam about his gardening journey. So I've, I've kind of always been in, into gardening in one way or another. And I think it's really my my mum actually that got me into it um, from a very young age. My, both of my nans gardened. Um, and I, I just remember long summers with my mum bending over weeding not bending with her knees just being completely bent over in all the wrong way um my dad mowing the lawn and you know just barbecues and things in the garden but i remember we had a we had a massive garden um when i was younger because we we're fortunate to just live on corner of a cul-de-sac so we kind of got a, a massive garden because of that my mom and dad grew all sorts um all the kind of standard things and some veg and um fruit as well um so i think subconsciously that's probably where where I've kind of got into it but then it kind of escaped me for a, quite a long while and it's really only this year um, that I've got back into it which I think obviously a lot of people have with um, lockdown and things like that but I just had that time to you know to actually do it we've got a, a young daughter and my wife, wife was on furlough she's a teacher um, so we suddenly had loads of time in our hands and we did all the bits and bobs of DIY around the house that we could think of uh, and then inevitably it turns to the garden, doesn't it? So, um, you know, we made the grass, did the weeding, and then suddenly when you could get to a garden centre and things like that, just suddenly started putting intended blossoming. Um, and I've just really kind of madly become obsessed with it. <laughs> so what were you doing with your garden before you lavished all this care on it? Was it, um, was it just a kind of afterthought once all the house stuff had been done? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, we, we made the grass and we, we had bits and bobs done in the garden. So we kind of had the fences done to make it look a bit nicer and a bit of patio that we've got was falling apart. So we had that done. And it's always somewhere that because we've got um, a child, we like to have that kind of space outside to be able to run about and kick a ball and all that. Um, so we'd mow the grass and we've got a, a couple of hedges. So we'd uh, trim those. And I would kind of plant stuff from time to time. Um, but I'd never really done anything massive. And then, to be perfectly honest, I think I was on, uh, I don't know whether I can say this or not, but I was on iPlayer and I came across Beach Grove. So rather than um, Gardener's World, I ended up watching an episode of Beach Grove and it was just kind of refreshing to see different people talking about gardening. Um, so then naturally I went, went and watched as many episodes of Beach Grove as I could. Um, and then I think that's kind of what got me into it. Started listening to Gardeners Question Time, which is which is great, but it can get a little bit repetitive. Um, but then, yeah, I I started um, just looking around on Facebook and Instagram, and I suddenly found a world of gardening that I didn't even know kind of existed. There's so many Facebook groups, local ones and um, national ones that people are part of, which are full. Uh, to the brim of really knowledgeable people that are just home growers um you know they're not particularly you know they're not trained or anything like that but they're just really good communities and the same with instagram and that's where my kind of gardening interest has has turned to um is instagram really Hmm. yeah it's interesting we spoke before and the traditional gardening media sometimes can be a bit limited um I don't know how you found it. I know when I got into gardening, I kind of, I, like you, I did the GQT thing and I, I binge listened that. And, you know, there were lots of things that I was trying to 
to listen to and to watch and to get information from but sometimes as you say there's there's a little bit of an alternative community bubbling under the surface which is where a lot of the time I was finding the real nuggets of kind of gold when it came to gardening information did you find a similar sort of thing Definitely. Um, Because I think, you know, you get, there's a bit of a joke on kind of GQT that, you know, if it's Bob Flower, you will end up mentioning the same things and that kind of thing. They're really interesting, um, but I find them quite limited. But then I think with things like Facebook and Instagram, all you need to do is quickly post a photo and a a little caption and suddenly you've got, you know, tens uh, tens of comments of people saying, oh, no, why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? Um, and I've I found just really interesting things and it probably well I say interesting they're probably quite mundane to most people but there's a there's a thread at the moment on this Facebook group that I'm part of um, it's talking about drainage in the bottom of pots it came out of talking about bulbs um, because obviously everyone's planting bulbs at the moment um, and someone popped in the comments and said oh don't forget to add you know crocs or gravel at the bottom for uh, for gra- drainage and then somebody. Um, chimed in this morning and said actually that's a, uh, an old wives tale which I, did, I didn't know might, some people might know that but I didn't know apparently if you put crocs and things at the bottom it actually um, keeps more water in the pot um, and actually keeps that raises the water level and actually raises it up nearer to the bulbs and actually makes them rot um, so little things like that you probably wouldn't really hear on GQ2 and stuff but because you've got this community of people that have some people are really into bulbs, some people are really into perennials and, and what have you. So you always get these different people chiming in and all sorts of difference of opinion. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I'd like to just say that there is an episode on container planting with container planting Queen Harriet Wright. <laughs> and she does actually mention the topic of crocs and advises against using them. Apparently mesh is the mesh is the thing. If you just put mesh at the bottom to stop the soil falling out, uh, it may say this in, in your episode. But, no, um, she doesn't. It, so no. I love that. I love the fact that there's always different kind of techniques. Exactly. I'll still put crocs in the bottom, though, to be honest. I, I can't see myself stopping doing it because I think most people, everybody does it. And I know. Them, I, I don't know why they do it if it's wrong. Yeah, I know exactly that, even though I know it's not best practice. I still <laughs> sometimes can't stop myself doing it. I think it's because a lot of people have already got the crocs in the bottom of the pot and it's actually more yeah. important to get rid of them. When you're reading, them, yeah. so you just leave them in there. Well, I went to the effort the other day. Of not have, I didn't have any crops or any old pots, and I just looked in the cupboard and found a, a mug that I didn't like, so I just smashed that up <laughs> instead. Um, I'm not condoning doing that, and because your cupboards will be bare of mugs. But there you go. So that's really interesting. It's the kind of instant answers that you get on social media, and yeah. that's, that's definitely a new format for for gardening advice. Have you returned to work now? Yeah. So I, uh, strangely, considering how uh, how quickly I got into the garden. I had a relatively short amount of time off um, compared to, I think, most people. And obviously, some people are still on furlough. I was only off for about six weeks. Um, so, that sounds, you know, in any normal time, that would be a long time, but, you know, where there's people now off for six months. But so I crammed quite a lot in in that time and we built a pergola, we built a seating area in that time and, and we did so much in that time. So, going back to work has been a bit of a not a, not a shock because I, I love work, but suddenly not being able to do what I've been doing kind of all day, every day um, was a bit a bit of an adjustment. And do you think you'll be able to manage the garden still with less time? Not to the same level that it was before, certainly. And because I'm still relatively new to it, I'm still taking a lot of information in. It's getting to a new season where... I will kind of hold my hands up and say, there's some things that I've got no idea what I need to do. You know, there are things that are turning that do I need to dig them out? Are they, you know, I bought them as plants. Do they actually, are they actually tubers? You know, so things like dahlias, for example. Um, what, what do I do with those? You know, and uh, but that for me has been part of the, the interesting thing about it is finding out all these new things. But I don't think I will uh, be able to keep it uh, to the same standard as it was making it sound like it's a, an RHS garden but um, I certainly don't think I will so I'm having to try and find ways of uh, maintaining it just you know how I, uh, yeah the best I can with the limited time that I've got. Do you think you might lose interest in it again? I don't think I will um, I've got quite an addictive personality so once I've, I'm into something called oh um i'll keep it going so i certainly don't think i i will uh, i've got a cold frame and i've started some seeds for next year and i've taken some cuttings for next year so even if my interest slightly kind of wanes over 
you know winter and christmas i'll i'll i know i'll go back to that cold frame and i'll see things that i've grown and i think right that will kind of spur me on again in the spring um and i've planted a load of bulbs as well so when things are kind of turning and when the spring comes through and things are starting to come up i think that will naturally bring me back out um so i don't think so i certainly hope not anyway yeah um i'm sure you won't because i think it is once you get the bug uh you know you're away but um are there any particular things that you've noticed that were time consuming and that you probably won't do you know going forward um i think i know it sounds daft but weeding is probably the the thing isn't it but obviously through winter a lot of that is just kind of suppressed so um i can kind of not not worry about that too much and once you've got to the point where a lot of you know you've cut back or you've divided your a bunch of perennials or whatever a lot of that work is kind of done obviously you don't really have to make the grass over winter so um i think it's a bit of a myth that you don't have to do things over winter because there's definitely lots to do um but i i think i think my interest will still stay there and because i've i'm so kind of into it on instagram um that'll keep my interest as well so even if i'm not out doing things physically all the time um i'll still i'll still keep a keep an eye in i actually put a shout out on twitter and said you know for anybody who is relatively new to gardening and has gone back to work after furlough what would be your top tips for certainly sort of the change in season and to keep the garden going over winter and yeah. i think almost exclusively people came back and said to me the soil you have to look after the soil which i thought was interesting um are you doing anything apart from obviously you know scaling back your weeding regime regime is there anything you're doing to you know help your soil through the winter or to try and improve it for next year no there's bits and bobs that i'll probably mulch um or i'll put a layer of gravel over a, a few bits and bobs but no I, i've I've got quite good soil. Uh, I mean, we're in, right in the middle of Birmingham, um, which you wouldn't think would have the best soil, um, but it actually is pretty good. It's quite acidic, which is which uh, is not necessarily strange, but does limit some of the things that we can grow. But that does mean that we can grow aces and things in the ground with kind of relative ease. But some of those will need a bit of care over winter. But in terms of the soil, it's really good actually. Um, what's your soil like where you are? We have got very heavy clay, so uh, either you can't get near it, it's like a rock, or it's you just get stuck in it. Um, so yeah. uh, constantly improving soil is a is a mission for me. Um, yeah, I haven't got I haven't got to do that, fortunately. No, well that's that is a big thing actually, and you're you're quite lucky with that. Um, so what other things are you thinking of doing that will maybe save you time, or because uh, I'm just aware that a lot of people have got into it really heavily, and part of my perennial concern for gardeners who are new to it is that they do they, they kind of get their teeth stuck into it they do lots of um, exciting projects and then sometimes the things fail and I yeah. worry that if they get to that failure point they l get disheartened and they lose interest and that's what I try and avoid with people I really really want them to sort of persevere and just have the knowledge to say yeah okay it's fine we can get through this even if we have a rough winter we will be fine we can come out the other side and we can start again so what what kind of tips could you offer to people who've not got maybe so much time oh I think so this is the thing isn't it with gardening it's it's almost entirely trial and error um and unless you train um you know you do an RHS course or or, or whatever um you don't really know and a, a lot of that is is trial and error and kind of um just trying things out so i think a lot of the time i, I was thinking about this this morning funnily enough i was partnering about in the garden this morning before we started and i think you almost have to go through two two years of garden to kind of really know um what your garden does um i've put two echinaceas in one right next to each other and the one has completely failed and the other one is is thriving um which is strange right next to each other so what i'll probably do next year is grow the same again and see but in a different place and see if it was that and then i know then for that third year just probably not to bother with that one or to do it in a pot or whatever um but in terms of of keeping things going over winter for me the the biggest challenge i've found is because i've got uh, i've got a small child most of my days off tend to be you know, going going out somewhere to the park or, you know, a, a National Trust or something. Um, so I don't tend to get too much time in the garden. And when I get home um, at half six, seven, 
it's already getting dark or is dark. So you're really limited as to what you can do. Strangely, today I've got a, a rare day off completely on my own, so I'm cramming in as much as I, as I possibly can. Um, but over winter, you're probably going to think I'm mad with this, but because it's dark, um, when we live, it, it gets really dark. I bought a headlight, um, like a miner. <laughs> So, yeah, it's a bit bit of a strange one. I tried it out the first time last night. It did feel like a bit of a bit of an oddball. And I think the garden, uh, the neighbours are probably looking out the windows thinking, what on earth is he doing? But it gives me enough light to be able to kind of deadhead the things that still need deadheading and pull up the weeds that I can, that I can see. Um, but I, I think that you need to pick one, one real thing for over kind of autumn and winter that you're going to continue doing. So whether that is weeding, or you know deadheading or whatever it is or you know maintaining the i don't know the, the shrubs or the hebes or whatever pick one thing that you're really going to invest your time in it might you know things might slip and i think that's fine you don't always there isn't i don't think there is ever a point where you just get to right okay i'll finish my garden i just don't think anybody ever gets to that do they well, it just I'm doesn't. It just doesn't happen. No, I'm definitely not there. I, you know, I've always got a list of things I want to do, and then I do those, and I think, okay, well, actually, that's raised something else, and I've got more space than I thought I had, or I've got less space than I thought I had. Um, but I think, yeah, just try and pick one thing to to keep going through winter. And you, we are fortunate, like I said earlier, we don't have to mow the lawn, we don't have to do a lot of things in winter. So that does, in theory, a bit more time. Um, it might mean that the daylight time is a bit less, but uh, yeah, that's what I would say. I always think that if you basically you can let your entire garden go over winter, yeah. you know, you, if you really haven't got the time and it's horrible weather, just let it go. And then if you if you want one thing to just kind of carry you through to next spring, just have one pot by your front door or one pot on your balcony, and that focus of that pot looking nice will just kind of lift you otherwise it's really easy to stand I mean you know I do it I stand at my kitchen sink and look out and just go oh my god it's hideous <laughs> uh, and it's really hard to, to get over that hurdle because actually the more you dread going out there the less you you go out there um, so you can feel a bit overwhelmed by it but if you can just te- if you can just ignore it and like you said it's never gone too far you know, you can always start again. It's fine. Um, just don't get overwhelmed by it and, and disillusioned with the whole thing. Just get yourself something really cheerful. You can even have an evergreen or if you pick a shrub that can sit in your eye line that is beautiful or, you know, looks good all year round or looks good in the autumn or the winter. It just gives you that little glimmer of hope and that little bit of interest to to start again next year. So I think, yeah, I think that's a brilliant tip. Exactly. I, I think there's something that I've, I've seen um, about, I don't know if it's it's kind of on the cusp of, being some sort of gardening trend god that sounds exciting um but bulb lasagnas uh, seem to be all over the place at the moment i don't know if you're seeing that but i i saw it on beach grove um i did one of uh, about three weeks ago and then i saw it on beach grove a couple of weeks ago and then on my facebook gardening group there's, there's tons of people doing it i've seen it all over instagram as well um but these they're really good things to kind of see through winter because um, I don't know if you talked about them on here, but and it's pretty obvious what it is. But it's basically layers of bulbs in a pot that flower at different times. Um, so come spring, you've kind of got a, a long lasting display. But it's the nice thing to do now. Obviously, now is the right time to start doing bulbs anyway. But it's a great thing to do now because if you if you do that and pop some um, winter bedding on the top, it's not very exciting. But um, pansies or you know violas or whatever that then you've got the colour through winter and then when you get to spring and things start to pop through you've got something that's kind of lasting you from now probably through to i don't know may which is quite a long time really it's not going to be the same the same thing for that whole time um but those are that's one good thing to really do and if you say if you've got that by your, your door which you'd want it somewhere kind of sheltered anyway and you see that you're seeing the you know the pansies through winter um that's a really nice thing to do mm, yeah agreed it is um Cool. Anything else that you think people should do? So I've something that I've done. Obviously, Instagram has kind of kept me uh, going because I've, I I'm seeing it as a bit of a kind of a journal or a log of uh, of what I've done over the last year. Um, but I've also started a garden journal as well. I've got a really brilliant um, five year RHS uh, gardener's record book, which um, has the five years on on every page. So. When I come to this week next year, I'll be able to see what I did last year, um, which, again, I think, especially for new gardeners, is a, 
is a great thing to do because you sometimes when you really get into it you can suddenly go into the garden center every weekend and buy loads of things and pop it in and it dies and you forget about it completely but i sometimes find uh i'll, I'll look back at the last few weeks and think god i think forgot i even bought that and it has gone and i haven't really uh, realized it's gone um so you know when you come to the time next year and you forgot about those plants that have sailed you'll look at your journal and you'll say okay i'm probably not going to try that again um i found that really really useful hmm. a lot of gardeners would not do that because they would be absolutely terrified at the amount of money and plants that they yeah <laughs> i did start writing the prices of things but oh. i stopped um because it was it was it was quite scary and also i'm just looking at it now the, the first week that i did it um i think i did it in may or june it's really detailed there's a weather section i put mixed wet and dry 15 degrees average uh, what days i was going to water the garden what's in bloom what tasks i was going to do and any other notes and i've just looked at last week's and then whether it just says wet plants bloom none and um, tasks mow the grass so that's uh, a bit different from three months ago <laughs> <laughs> yeah well again that's something you can pick up i suppose when you've got more time and and some weeks if you don't do it it's not the end of the world but um yeah it's a brilliant record to have and, and like you say instagram's excellent because you can i sometimes think oh i can't for the life of me remember what that daily was called and i'll just flick through my instagram and then i'll, I'll actually have written it on at the time so yeah that's really helpful it is, yeah. Um, I think the only other thing that I um, have really wanted to do now that the garden's kind of settled and I, I kind of know what's working, or I, know, I certainly know what has worked and I think will probably come back next year, is I've always wanted to kind of sketch out the garden as well, just so I can look at it and think about what's what's where. Um, so I've started to kind of do that, not in any great detail, but just to write the border and just plot on what's what. I've also found that really helpful for because I've put a load of bulbs in the in the gaps um and i i tend to just kind of go rogue and i'll, I'll end up just getting a, uh, a trowel out and I'll, I'll dig a bulb so i've plotted on there where i've put bulbs in as well um but I, i'm almost certain that that'll be the last time i'll do that i don't think i'll sketch it again because it, it'll just change again next year i'll end up digging things up and moving them and i can't remember to sketch it all again it's too much hassle fair enough um i mean photographs <laughs> are, are good too yeah. yeah well that's what i'm finding with instagram um to be honest is that that's it's a really good it is a good record but it's just a nice way of you know there's, there's hashtags and all sorts of stuff so if you pop up a picture of a i don't know hydrangea and you pop up the hydrangea hashtag and you click it and see everybody else's hydrangeas and every now and again you'll see the one that you've put in and think god theirs looks tons better than mine what am i doing wrong and then you just pop them a comment and say oh you know and then it, it just becomes this um you know, back and forth, which I don't think you think of Instagram, things like that, having a gardening community as such. You just think it's, you know, I'm going to sound really old now, but Kim Kardashian or whatever, you know, post pictures themselves. But it's it's not it's not that. There's so much more. And strangely, this is going on another level. I'm probably slightly too old to be on TikTok. Um, but I downloaded TikTok the other day just to see if there was a gardening kind of community on there. And there is. It's not as... It's kind of vibrant as um, Facebook and Instagram, but it's on there. And that's obviously the next thing that will that will come along. Um, and I think it's really important for those things to come about for, you know, the next generation of, of gardeners. So I'm only 32, but um, to be into gardening as much as I am, is, you know, it's not rare for a 32-year-old, but it's it's always seen as a shoddy duddy um, thing, isn't it, gardening? But it's, it's not. I don't think it is anyway. No. I mean, it might be. It shouldn't be, though. Um, no it depends what you do with it though doesn't it um, I guess so yeah you know. I think probably a lot of the well from what the feedback I get it seems as if um, the slightly younger audience is is more perhaps more involved in kind of the growing food movement um, you know, there's a lot of sort of social responsibility that goes with with the garden really definitely yeah there's tons of allotment here on on instagram they probably own number gardeners to be honest but yeah. seeing some of the stuff that they're doing but again you know probably a few years ago you would you, know, you drive past, past an allotment and you, you inevitably it's it's kind of the same uh kind of middle-aged people that are you know growing their pumpkins or whatever but it's not that anymore it's definitely not and i think the waiting list for allotments i saw i have to find it try and find it but i saw a statistic the other day that, that it now takes twice as long to to get an allotment there's a lot of people and it took a long time before didn't it 
Mm-hmm. Um, but because so many people have got into it during lockdown. But it's hope, like you say, you said earlier, it's kind of hoping that those people uh, carry it on and knowing that there's, you know, a failed crop if it's an allotment doesn't mean that you failed. You know, you can you can try it again or try something different. It might just be that your circumstances are not right for that particular crop. Mm. Yeah, I saw a scheme on Facebook the other day that was advertising this rent a garden scheme. I think you could, you know, if you had a garden and you didn't necessarily want to do anything with it, you could rent it out to somebody who did. So maybe that might be a good way forward. Yeah, that's a good idea. I've not seen that. Mm. Yeah, I was thinking of renting mine out. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned you've got a young daughter. Are you involved yeah. in her in gardening? Yeah, as much as possible. Um, so she's she's only two at the moment. She's nearly three. So she probably at the start of the year when we started, uh, she wasn't really interested. And we had all that glorious weather. So I was just happy with her kind of getting under my feet, to be honest. That was that was great. But we've got a, a little herb garden um, and we've got a, an old kind of whiskey barrel that we've turned into a, um, like a fairy garden. A bit of a cliche, but we've put some little plants in there and things that need deadheading. So really basics but through summer we put petunias in um and you know obviously they just need kind of constantly deadheading um so we got her helping with that and she likes she's got a little water and can she likes to water the garden and the other day it's strange i hadn't realized how much she'd she'd picked up um but we were stood by the the herbs and she was rubbing her hands on smelling her hand and she went mm, mint and i didn't know that she'd she knew and for a kind of a two-year-old I thought that was brilliant um so she'd obviously obviously picked up what we'd been what we'd been saying and now she knows that we kind of use it in uh food and things as well so I'm hoping slowly that kind of every time she'll understand that that's where kind of our food comes from and um and all that kind of thing so yeah she's she's loving it the next generation of gardeners appears to be in safe hands Many thanks to Adam for speaking to me about his gardening journey and don't forget you can follow his journey on Instagram, links in the show notes. Thanks to you two for listening. To play us out, here's Dr Ian Bedford talking about a not-so-welcome garden visitor. I don't kill anything in my garden, so I would not want to be presented with the moral dilemma of finding a flatworm, which has thankfully not happened thus far. But if you do find what you think is a flatworm, or in fact any other bug that you're not sure about, Please don't act on a knee-jerk impulse to squish it. Always make sure to cry. Always make sure to correctly identify bugs before deciding whether to act as judge, jury, and executioner. During the 1960s, Britain's gardeners were being alerted to the appearance of a new invasive, slimy-looking ribbon-like creature called a flatworm that was coming in with pot plants imported from the other side of the world. This was the New Zealand flatworm, a dark brown species that could grow up to eight inches long. Then 20 years later, the Australian flatworm, a much smaller orange species also began appearing. Flatworms are a very primitive group of organisms that have remained unchanged for about 500 million years and are thought to be the oldest living ancestors to all bilateral animals which are those that have a right and a left-hand side. The appearance in Britain of these two invasive species, though, initially caused great concern, since they were known to be voracious predators of one of the most important soil conditioning and organic waste recycling creatures, the earthworms, which were also a vital food source for many of our native wildlife. Despite efforts to contain the spread of these flatworms, Both species have now become established in Britain, with the New Zealand flatworm mainly within the northern regions, whilst the Australian just within the southern counties of England and Wales. And so it's not uncommon to find at least one of these species within home gardens, under plant pots, or in a shady damp area on the soil surface, where they can remain active throughout the year. And although their impact on the native earthworm populations might not be noticeable, it's often quite severe. So when these species of flatworm are found, the current advice is to report the sightings to the British Non-Native Secretariat, and if possible to destroy the creatures. Since there are no products available for their control, this would have to be done manually, but it might be worth knowing 
that flatworms are capable of reproducing by a process known as fission, where detached sections of their bodies can grow back into new individuals. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All. Roots and All.